All right, I'd like to get started with this session. Welcome everybody back to the 2019 Schooneman Symposium. I should have mentioned earlier that we have a hashtag, it's hashtag Schooneman 2019 if anybody wants to, uh, to tweet or um, participate in that way. We also are live streaming some of these events, so this is one of the ones we are live streaming. Um, my name is Bob Stewart, I'm the director of the School of Journalism and it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be one of the organizers for the Schooneman Symposium. This next session is definitely something that qualifies as a big story. Matt Zapatowski is a national security reporter who covers the Justice Department and the FBI for the Washington Post. He's been covering the Robert Mueller special counsel investigation since its inception and was part of the Washington Post uh, team that won the Polk Award for series on Donald Trump and Russia. Now, starting about a month ago, I started doing screenshots of the Washington Post stories that had a Matt Zapotowski byline. And these are the screenshots from my phone, probably just from about two to three weeks ago. So to say that Matt has been on the front lines of the, uh, the Robert Mueller and the, the Manafort trial and all these other big stories coming out of Washington is, is to sort of say the, the most uh, uh, minimal way of putting it. I mean, Matt is one of two reporters at the Washington Post with credentials to get into the Justice Department. So um, he's not physically here with us today, but he is here by Skype. So I want to finish the introduction and, um, and then turn this over to, to Matt. And this is a first. We've never Skyped anybody in for a Schooneman Symposium, and it was our intent and Matt's intent to, to be, for him to be here. But as, uh, as events unfolded, um, we obviously know where he is and what he's doing. Uh, Matt has been at the Washington Post since 2008 spent much of his career covering law enforcement and the court system in Maryland and Virginia. He grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and is a graduate of the School of Journalism here at Ohio University. And I should note that right before he was at The Post, he was, well, at The Post <laughs> here, where he served as editor his last year in the Scripps School. Before I turn the program over to Matt, I just want to say that, love it or hate it, the Mueller report um, the reason it landed when it did is, I believe, because of the amazing power of the Schooneman Symposium. <laughs> when, <laughs> when I first talked to Matt about speaking at this year's program, he warned me that all bets were off if the report landed right before or during the symposium. And in fact, uh, as, it was not, uh, as it was clear that the report was about to hit, he had agreed that he would Skype in with us, but he said if the report hits in the middle of the symposium, he would literally walk off the screen to cover the story. So uh, we're hopeful that he will be here for the whole, the whole program today. Um, needless to say, we've been watching the signals from DC very, very carefully. And as it did indeed appear that the report would be delivered about when it was, we started calculating on the different possible ways that Matt could still be with us, if not actually with us. We're sad, Matt, that you can't be here, but we're delighted that, uh, that you're still able to, to join us today to share with us the important insights of this uh, frontline story. Um, as I've said, the, Matt, you can't really see this, but behind you are, are all of the screenshots from your... <laughs> uh, so everybody, please welcome Matt Zapotowski. first off, uh, and you sort of stole a little bit what I was going to talk about in introducing myself. I'm Matt Zapatowski. I'm a, a 2008 graduate of OU. Um, I was supposed to prepare like a 55-minute speech today uh, and leave some time for questions, but given that it's kind of awkward and we're talking on Skype, which wasn't my preference, I'm going to try to keep it to maybe 30 minutes or so, and then hopefully you guys have a lot of questions um, to ask me to fill the rest of the time, and you can get on to your next class or whatever uh, more quickly. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit about me and some other stories I covered. It, it, you know, as I understand it, the purpose of this is like the big story, and before Mueller, I have been involved in other stories, so I want to talk about those a little bit and then get up to kind of current, you know, current day where we are now. 
starting with a little bit about me, like Bob said, I'm a former editor of The Post at OU. I left college a little bit early for an internship at The Washington Post here. Um, and initially, I was way out in our Southern Maryland bureau. The Post had and has a series of kind of regional bureaus all around D.C. And at the time, they had one way down, uh, way down south um, in a almost rural area, suburban rural area called the Southern Maryland Bureau. So I started my career there covering law enforcement, very sort of rural crime. I moved from there to the Prince George's County Bureau, which is a lot more urban. It's the suburb just kind of that borders the south and east of D.C. Again, I covered law enforcement. The county at that time had roughly about 100 homicides a year, and it was just like a very sort of classic police beat. From there, I moved to covering the federal courthouse in Virginia, which will sort of become important to sort of talk later. Um, that was my first exposure to bigger kind of national stories. I cut my teeth there covering the corruption trial for the former Virginia governor, Bob McDonald, which was a huge deal in the D.C. region and even got sort of national pick up. Um, I also had a lot of sort of homegrown terror cases that I covered there. And so that experience lent itself really well to covering the Justice Department in early 2016. Uh, I, I got a call. I was actually on the way to Florida to visit a friend for his 30th birthday. He said, hey, we're going to move you to justice next month. I had been expecting it, but it was sort of the call was a little bit unexpected. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a little bit about me. Moving to sort of the big story, um, the Post, unlike the Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Associated Press, we don't have like a cadre of bureaus around the country like we do around the D.C. region. So big stories, big national stories fall to a little bit smaller group of people. And when you cover the Justice Department and the FBI, you end up just sort of naturally getting a lot more of those, particularly like big shootings. So a couple months into my tenure on the justice beat, um, I get a call. Uh, I'm actually away at my bachelor party in New Orleans. It's like the early Saturday, early Sunday morning. We had been out much of Saturday night. And the house we were staying in is sort of one of these shotgun style houses in New Orleans, which means like one room kind of goes into another room, kind of goes into another room. There aren't hallways and there weren't a ton of outlets in every room. So I had left my phone, excuse me, in a room where I wasn't staying. Um, Anyway, that morning, my phone begins to ring sort of off the hook. I can hear it buzzing in there. And at first, I ignore it. I ignore it. Um, you know, I had a very responsible night the night before, but uh, for some reason, I was still tired. Um, but I eventually, I'm like, gosh, this has got to be something big. I should go in there, go into the other room. And I see my editor is sort of frantically texted me, has been emailing for much of the night. Um, it turns out that a guy named Omar Mateen had just shot and killed 49 people in a nightclub in Orlando. And we, of course, needed to be on it. I'm telling this story because it kind of speaks to one of what I think are one of the important lessons to covering any big story. You have to be there. Um, so you know, as our FBI reporter course, I start immediately like calling FBI sources, at least the few I had only having been on the beat a couple months, check in with my colleague on the beat, Adam Goldman, who was similarly calling sources and also book a sort of change in flight. I was scheduled that morning to fly back to D.C., but you got to be there. This is sort of where the story is. So I had like no work clothes. I didn't have a work ID, uh, but you know, I had my laptop, thank God, and I had my cell phone, and I had a phone charger. So change my flight, get to get to uh, Orlando by that evening and just brace for, uh, you know, a big week of covering the, the big story. That night that I arrived, I actually sort of checked in at the scene. Then I went to Target to buy a bunch of clothes that I knew I would need that week. Later in the week when I'm covering it, I don't have a work ID, and they're sort of making people... Um, they're sort of making people show their press pass to get past the 
police tape where they're doing press conferences, where the victim's family members are hanging out. And, and at least once, most of the time, I said, well, I'm with the Washington Post, and they would kind of let me through. But one time, there was a sort of insistent police officer, I need your work ID. So I pulled out my cell phone and showed him my Twitter profile, like, see, I really work at the Washington Post. Um, we, we spent about a week down there. My assignment was to work law enforcement sources, but also to talk to the real people on the scene, passersby, uh, people who were in the club at that time had kind of returned to the scene or that we learned were in the club and whose houses we would show up at, relatives of people who were killed, people who were wounded. Um, our other FBI reporter who I mentioned, Adam Goldman, was back working law enforcement sources uh, remotely just via the phone. And I feel like our stories had a good blend of kind of exclusive law enforcement information, but also the, the humanity of what had happened. It was such a huge loss, one of the worst terrorist attacks that the country has ever seen. And I think we were able to do that. And this kind of speaks to my to my point. Um, and I haven't even forgotten it covering Mueller. There's no substitute. There's no substitute for being there. You can't cover a story just from phones and watching TV press conferences. I think we, particularly big organizations like The Post, get tempted to do that now because we don't have people all around the country, because it is easy to just watch things live stream, because it's easy to connect with people digitally. And we still do a bunch of that. People just tweet reactions now. Uh, you don't always have to call somebody. You can watch Twitter and see people reacting in real time and see, oh my gosh, this is a witness. This is You still have to call people. You still have to show up. And good reporters have to actually get in people's faces. I think one of the reasons we got so much information down in Orlando is you had this huge group of reporters, almost like a city full of reporters who were asking cops, asking officials who would show up on the scene, like councilmen and other elected officials, what happened? Why did this happen? And you need reporters there. You know, when I was covering local crime in Southern Maryland and Prince George's County, um, you didn't, there was no choice. You couldn't watch police press conferences live streamed then. It wasn't like Periscope. And, um, and you know, and the stories weren't so nationally important that CNN was going to blast them out and in full. It's like me and a handful of TV reporters who are getting in cops' faces, asking them questions. And that's how we get information. Um, another sort of lesson that, uh, that I, you know, would, would stress that it's clear in Orlando, it's clear in a lot of big stories, is sources are human beings, and you should never sort of lose sight of that or, or lose their numbers. Um, so before Orlando, early 2016, I get on the justice beat, and the big story at that time is the investigation that preceded Robert Mueller's, the Clinton email investigation, the investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. I'm not going to take you through all the twists and turns of that because I want to leave some time to talk about Mueller. But when I got on the beat, that investigation had been going on for many, many months. And I was just kind of dropped into the middle of it, which is the absolute worst way to kind of cover a big story. The ideal way to cover a big story is to be on a beat for a long time. And then the people you cover and have relationships with just end up in the middle of a big story. So when that thing happens, you know all the players, you know exactly who to call, um, you know kind kind of the parameters and the process questions. When I had left the federal courthouse in Virginia, I felt like I was just getting to that point with that courthouse. I knew all the defense attorneys who were likely to get big cases. I knew many of the prosecutors. I knew the local cops there, you know, FBI people who would bring the cases in. So when something happened, even if I wasn't the person to break it, I generally knew, well, this is where that information is coming from, or this is where I can learn that information. Same when I covered local police departments, you know. I knew exactly, well, these are the points where information is likely to come out. But in early 2016, during the Clinton investigation, uh, I knew pretty much nobody. And so I, one day, I think it might have even been my first week on the beat, my boss calls me into his office with our FBI reporter, who I mentioned earlier, Adam Goldman. And he says, Marty, who's Marty Barron, our editor-in-chief, is really interested in us getting to the bottom of this Clinton investigation. We need to break more stories out of it. And we need to be as if we are inside this thing. Um, and my colleague, Adam, 
basically loses it. He's kind of a temperamental guy. Uh, and he says, this is outrageous. You really expect Matt, who's on his first week in the job, to get inside this investigation that, you know, reporters have been trying to get inside for many months. It's unrealistic. It's laughable, uh, which, I, you know, I now have come to really appreciate it. I appreciate it at the time. He's standing up for me. He's kind of managing expectations with the bosses. This was a really unrealistic um assignment and he's setting expectations low but i have to say i was able to make some sources on it and as it would turn out some of the attorneys involved in the case were from that courthouse that i used to cover and that is sort of why i say don't ever lose your sources phone numbers don't ever stop maintaining your connections with the people you meet on various beats throughout your life because you never know when those people are going to come up in another big story down the road the small stories you know slogging it out at the courthouse and being covering cases and being there for cases that not as many people care about is how you have the sources when the big story breaks when you get dropped in the middle of something and you know nobody it's those people you know from covering the many smaller stories uh, and then they happen to be involved in something interesting another lesson i sort of took from that which helped sort of inform my Mueller coverage is don't be intimidated now like in that first meeting i was pretty intimidated i left and called my dad and said oh my gosh you know i'm in the middle of this big thing i have no sources you know, when I was in Prince George's County, like I mentioned, I would show up on a scene and it would be me and maybe four or five local TV reporters, um, some of whom who weren't all that experienced, um, you know, a couple of whom who were. But I, I always felt like I was right in the competition and there wasn't that much competition. It was like a league of five. When you cover something like Clinton or Mueller, you have at a minimum five for the big organizations, like a dozen of their best people, their most experienced reporters uh, who are all assigned to cover the same thing that you are. So it's super competitive. There are just a huge volume of story and a huge volume of people providing information to reporters on it. But a big story is still a story, and you have to treat it the same way. So with Clinton, I would do what I did with any story, which is read everything there is out there about that story. Try to meet as many people as you can. Because of that reading, because of your conversations, shape smart questions so people will actually give you information, know what techniques work with different people. And I was able to get some scoops, even in the early days. We were one of the people, I, I think we reported exclusively early on of this encounter where Huma Abedin walks out of a meeting with the FBI because of tension over some questions they were asking in a preamble they read. Um, we were one of the first to report with CNN that the investigation was trending towards no charges because investigators were having a tough time proving that there was corrupt intent. Um, we were also competitive when the investigation concluded in July, and Jim Comey famously had that press conference where he said he was recommending that Hillary Clinton not be charged, but that he felt she was extremely careless in the handling of her emails. And then we were competitive again in October when it was suddenly uh, back on. And by that time, Adam Goldman, the guy who had sort of stood up for me in the office a couple months earlier, had left the paper to go to the Times. So I was sort of competing with a guy who'd been on the beat for many years uh, prior to me and you know, I, who I still consider sort of a mentor. Um, so that's a long way of bringing us to you know, the biggest story I've ever covered, which is the Mueller investigation. Uh, I came to the Mueller investigation in a very weird way. And even as I sit here today and as I was sitting um, just before the Mueller, uh, Mueller investigation was concluded last week, sort of writing this speech as I was staking out the Justice Department, I couldn't exactly remember how I first came to this. It was it was in this summer 2016 time period that we now know the investigation into various Trump campaign aides or associates and possible coordination had begun, that I started hearing tips mainly from our politics reporters and our investigative reporters asking me in a sort of cryptic way, have you heard anything about the FBI 
opening a Russia-related investigation. You got to remember at the time, this is sort of um, this is sort of still in the heart of Clinton. It's it's both pre-Clinton ending and right immediate post-Clinton ending. So there's this great pressure to reconstruct that. And also the Clinton investigation would sort of resume in October. But it's in this time frame that I'm hearing, getting asks from other places in the newsroom, hey, can you ask the Bureau about this? And there's also a plenty weird public stuff. You know, um, we know now that the Bureau had opened a case then, but we didn't know that at the time. We didn't know that the Bureau was doing this. It did a great job keeping it secret. Um, even as there was public things happening, WikiLeaks is releasing emails. President Trump is sort of publicly welcoming the release of that email. He gives this famous Russia, if you're listening, speech that I'm sure everyone remembers. At the time, I couldn't get any traction in the bureau. And I know my colleagues and competitors at other outlets really couldn't either. It was just super, super close hold, which is a difficulty in a lot of high profile investigations, kind of the higher profile it is, the more efforts government agencies make to keep everything under wraps. The New York Times did some reporting on a Russia related investigation kind of right near the election, but their story said that it was basically dead. That story is now a great source of consternation for them. We were probably more silent on the question. We did some stories, um, but it was it was a tough, it was sort of a tough slog. Um, you all now know that in the months after the election, that would change very rapidly. In January 2017, um, BuzzFeed published what we now know as the dossier. Um, that had been in the hands of FBI agents. I sort of learned in real time that that had been in, in the hands of many reporters, including some at our organization who kept it very close hold. In March of 2017, Jim Comey famously confirmed in front of Congress that the FBI was investigating Russian interference and possible coordination with the Trump campaign. And then in May, after Comey was fired, um, Mueller was appointed a special counsel. In those first six months of 2017, the Post was at the forefront of a lot of the Russia-related stories. Um, I can't, I don't have time right now to go through them all, but I'll tell you one which I contributed to that sort of speaks to another, I think, important lesson of covering the big story, which is be plugged in on your beat and keep doing the little things well in the context of a big story. So I remember pretty vividly one day in 2017, I hear Adam Entis, who kind of sat across from me at the time, we're in cubicles at the Post, and I'm in an odd one because it's just me and then a divider, and then across from me, there is my desk mate, and who's Adam Entis at the time. So I hear him take a call, and I overhear some of the call, and he pops up afterwards, and he says, I just got a tip that Jeff Sessions met with the Russian ambassador during the campaign. That, at the time, would have been a significant story just in its own right. There was so much focus on contacts between um, Trump campaign officials and Russians. There was a lot of focus on Mike Flynn at the time, who had had a call with the recalls with the Russian ambassador during the presidential transition period after Trump was elected, but before he was sworn into office. But we didn't know anything about Sessions' contacts with Russians, if any. And I remembered when Adam was telling me this, well, I had just watched Jeff Sessions' confirmation hearing a couple months earlier and towards the end of a very long day when we're kind of live blogging this thing, um, you know, updating repeatedly, I figure it was live blogging, but updating repeatedly a story about it all day long. I remember this exchange he had with Al Franken. CNN had just published a story about contacts between Trump campaign officials and Russians, and Al Franken asked Sessions about that story kind of in this meandering way, like CNN has just broken the story. What are your thoughts on this? And I remember vividly that Sessions declared he had not had contacts with Russians. He said something like, I'd been a surrogate a time or two. I've been called a surrogate a time or two, because I think the CNN story used the word surrogate. And I certainly haven't contacts with Russians. So I told Adamentus, my colleague, well, if, if your tipster's right, 
that would contradict what Sessions said at his congressional hearing. So Adams' eyes kind of get wide, and he scurries off, and um, a few him and a few others do some more reporting, and pretty quickly they confirm this thing. Jeff Sessions had met when he was a senator with Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador. His answer to Congress was at best pretty misleading. So he would end up amending that congressional testimony, recusing himself from the Mueller investigation a day after Adam's story ran. Andrew McCabe, the deputy director of the FBI, would come become the FBI director after Jim Comey was fired, would end up launching an investigation into whether Sessions had lied. And to be clear, my role in the story was fairly minimal. I got up and sort of shared this information with Adam Entis. I think I made maybe one call to a justice spokesperson. Um, it would a justice spokesperson would ultimately confirm all of this. But um, and I just my role was to tell Adam, well, look, Sessions said the opposite. And then I think I sent him the transcript of what Sessions had, had said specifically. Um, but I was able to do that because even amidst this high profile story, I stayed plugged in on the beat. You know, I watched and absorbed the confirmation hearing and remembered what Sessions had said. Now, Adam might have found his way to that eventually. He probably would have. He's a great reporter. Um, or he would have written a story that said Sessions had contacts with Russians, and that would have been a great story in its own right. And then somebody else would have said, well, and also Sessions denied that in front of Congress. But our sort of communicating and me remembering that helped make it a better story right in real time. It wasn't just that Sessions had had contacts with the Russian ambassador, which he could arguably explain away. It was that he had told Congress the opposite. And that, I think, made for a better story, a better first day story. Uh, and that story was a part of a Pulitzer package that that um, Adam and, and others shared in. So another uh, lesson in, in that, I feel like, is on a big story and on any story, Teamwork is really key. The Post has more than a dozen reporters who have some hook into the Mueller probe, the Russia probe, and we had for quite some time. Some are kind of Congress specialists. Some cover the White House. A couple, like me, cover the Justice Department and the FBI. Uh, we now meet three times a week to bounce ideas off each other, to share tips, um, to come up with kind of frames for stories. And I think that's a part of how The Post has been able to separate ourselves on the Mueller story, the Russia story. Um, no one reporter is going to have uh, all of the skills you would want, uh, all the different skill sets you would want. Some reporters are better writers. Some are better at getting initial tips, but maybe not bringing them home. Some are closers, can kind of massage out with a source, provided they have an initial hook to do so, the nitty gritty, they can get to the details. Others have like great memories and they know exactly what questions to ask. So because no one person is gonna be the best at all of those, if you assemble a team of people and have all those skills skill sets represented and had everybody talking, that's when you can really do well. To give another Mueller example from that, my colleague on the Justice Department, one of the two people who are going to spend a lot of time in the department because we have hard passes. I do need to correct. I told Bob we only have two, but I think we actually have three who have hard passes. The one is detailed now to something else. Um, but Devlin Barrett, a while back, gets a tip about this possible meeting between Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general who appointed Mueller, and Andrew McCabe kind of right after Mueller is appointed. And he gets a tip that this is kind of a tense meeting. So that's sort of all we know. But it's really intriguing to us. People don't really know, and we're still trying to figure out, all of Bob Mueller's origin story, all of the origin story of this investigation. And this meeting in the days after he's appointed has our interest peaked. So we're not sure what to make of it. This is after the New York Times has reported that Rod Rosenstein, according to Andrew McCabe, suggested using the 25th Amendment to potentially oust President Trump or maybe wearing a wire to listen to him or to record conversations with President Trump. So we know there's tension between McCabe and Rosenstein in real time over the reporting of that story, but we're trying to figure out what's happening in these days after Mueller is appointed. So I go to a source, get a little bit more information. Devlin goes back to his source. We go to other sources. It's this game of like trying to triangulate and, and fact check and run things off the other. And I get along with some of the people who know all about this. Devlin gets along with others. 
And some of it lines up, some of it doesn't. But finally, we get to the set of facts that sort of everybody agrees on. And in fact, what happened at this meeting is Rod Rosenstein and Andrew McCabe were very hot at each other. Neither at this moment really trust the other. Andrew McCabe is mad at the role Rod Rosenstein had played in firing Jim Comey. Rod Rosenstein, maybe everybody knows, wrote a memo supportive of his firing. Rod Rosenstein doesn't trust Andrew McCabe because he feels like he too quickly opened up this obstruction of justice case into the president after Comey's firing. Was that retaliatory for his boss being fired? And so in this meeting at which Bob Mueller is present, they both sort of say to the other, you need to recuse. No, you need to recuse. And this is an important aspect of kind of the Mueller origin story, you know, because of the tension gripping FBI and DOJ, that tension is a part of why Mueller is appointed. And me and Devlin are able to break that story because we work well together um, and, and have relationships with different sets of people. But combined, we can sort of get all of these people to talk to the post. Um, there are times in covering a big story uh, that kind of suck. I think like so far I've described all these energetic moments of great reporting, but some days really do, really are unpleasant. I remember uh, about six months after the Post has gotten, you know, scoop after scoop on the Russia case, and it's a weekend, and the New York Times breaks a story about this Trump Tower meeting with Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner and this Russian lawyer who's offering Russian government dirt on Hillary Clinton. It was just a huge scoop. I think we're still trying to figure out the significance of that meeting, but one of the seminal scoops in the Russia-related coverage. And after six months of really feeling like we had owned the story, that was a gut check for us at The Post. It's part of the reason we started meeting more often. I think we met once a week at that time, started meeting three times a week so we could talk over more tips and just be in better touch with one another. Um, I feel like the lesson in that, though, is on a big story, especially the Mueller story, there are just so many talented reporters uh, that you are not going to win every fight. It's just a fact of life. The same way our organization tries to have people of all sorts of different skill sets and source bases so that we don't miss anything, every other organization does that too. And there are going to be people at the Times who vibe with sources in the way that I and Devlin and Roz Helderman and Carol Lennig just can't do. You're going to get beat on big stories. You're going to get pressed to match stories on the weekend and at 11 at night. You're almost never going to sleep easy in the context of a big story. And there are a lot of unglamorous moments in covering big stories. So a lot of my past several weeks have been spent inside the DOJ press room, surrounded by competitors such that it's very difficult to make any good phone calls without stepping into the hall or stepping into the courtyard. So I can possibly spot Mueller or the attorney general or Rod Rosenstein for any kind of clue that the Mueller report had been transmitted to the attorney general or that the investigation was over. It's so tense and competitive that, uh, you know, I didn't even want to leave and none of my competitors wanted to leave the building even for like 10 minutes to get lunch. So I just had this big box of uh, those kind bars at my desk that I would just eat throughout the day until we sort of got a lid. TV reporters had it much worse. Many of them had to stand outside the building or outside Bill Barr's house, um, just staking out in the cold, in the rain to track these guys' movements. Reporting is mostly not glamorous. Sure, there are sort of um, drinks or lunches with sources where you get information and run back to the newsroom excited, but a lot of it is waiting and watching and frustration. How it did pay off, uh, the moment that Congress, well, the moment that Congress was told the investigation was over, D DOJ reporters were told too, and a part of that was just our being there and pressing. They knew they couldn't hide that from us or keep that from us because we were all, all over them, and we pressed them, the Justice Department, on the importance of letting the public uh, know that something was happening. The moment that that went down, um, 
the just the Maine's Justice Department spokesman comes down with this letter that has just been delivered to Congress, hands it out to all these reporters who run to their phones and desks and type up alerts. The investigation is done. Of course, we had pre-written so many stories to be ready for this moment. Um, and then the spokesperson sticks around. And this is why I say it helps to be there and it helps to be plugged in on the beat and read everything because she takes questions, you know, and that's what public officials do. But if you have a group of reporters who don't know what to ask, who haven't been plugged in, you're not going to get a lot of information. So you have a group of reporters there who have owned this story for a long time, who know what to ask and get some of those initial things like, when was the White House notified? Who delivered the Mueller report here? What specifically was the White House notified of? The critical questions that readers would want to know. Um, you know, I think a lot of people might say, um, well, you're just there getting a handout. And I, I remember having this conversation with a college roommate at one point. Uh, we're sitting playing Xbox, and I'm telling him how stressed I am to have to cover this. Uh, and he says, well, why are you so stressed? It's all going to come out. And then he kind of stops himself. He's like, oh, no, wait, it's going to come out because you're going to put it out. And, and that's exactly right, right? Even in these handout moments, they're a product of us pressing and pressing and asking and arguing and getting it so we're getting information to give to the public. Admittedly, we don't get everything. And admittedly, there are many questions that we still have that the Justice Department has not been willing to answer. But it's our being there uh, that gets this information. It also comes at a cost to your personal life. I was really looking forward to being with you all there in person today, um, you know, getting together with my friends who are still in Ohio. And as Bob said, I had to cancel at sort of the absolute last minute just because I can't really justify in the heat of this flying to Ohio and flying back in a day. We still don't know exactly when the actual Mueller report is going to come, though I do think we have some time. Um, later this week, I'm supposed to start a vacation in Hawaii. That is maybe in jeopardy, at least at the very least. It seems like I might have some work to do on that. Like I said, reporting isn't glamorous, even on big stories. You end up putting a lot of your personal life on hold um, to be a part of that. But I think that sort of speaks to my final lesson, which I always try to remind myself of, and that's um, what we do covering a big story is really important. I mean, like, like I was telling my college roommate when he sort of said, well, it's all going to come out, like it all comes out because of people like me and my colleagues and my competitors, even the non-anonymously sourced scoopy stuff. And that stuff might not come out at all if it weren't for us, but it's because of reporters searching court dockets, showing up at court hearings, getting in lawyers' faces, getting in public officials' faces, asking people to do interviews, to come on their shows. You know, if theoretically there, were, there weren't reporters, like no reporters at all, there'd be no anticipation of a Mueller report or even a summary of a Mueller report. You wouldn't know about all of these Trump advisors in court accused of wrongdoing because there'd be no TV reporters outside the courthouse or print reporters live tweeting what is happening or live blogging what is happening. We devote immense resources to getting this information out. And if reporters cease to exist, it wouldn't. It, it's cool. You have to remind yourself it is cool to be the person, be part of the team that brings that to our democracy, the, the part of the team that kind of brings this information to people so they can decide uh, what to do. And I'm totally agnostic about what should be done. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of criticism, uh, media criticism about how we've handled the Mueller coverage in light of the conclusion that the president, that Mueller couldn't find that the president coordinated with Russia and that Mueller kind of punted on the question of obstruction. Um, certainly some of that is fair. Some of the breathless speculating and over torquing, there are lessons to be learned. There are lessons to be learned about taking a deep breath. But I don't think any less of the fact that the story was any less important because the conclusion was the president didn't conspire. This was a big story. This was a criminal investigation, a 22-month criminal investigation of the president of the United States. And the stakes of that criminal investigation was whether his campaign conspired 
fired with a foreign adversary, adversary, excuse me, that warranted aggressive and extensive coverage. And that's what we gave it. And I was thrilled to be a part of the end of it, no matter how it ended. It didn't, I'm sort of agnostic to uh, it ending with um, Lawler accusing the president of obstructing justice and coordinating or him deciding the opposite. It's just something that the public deserves to know. For a time, you know, the presidency was at stake here. The president's legal or at least political culpability was on the line. And it's just an honor to be a part of the team that tells the world about that, no matter what, you know, decision makers end up deciding. Um, so with that, uh, hopefully this format is conducive for it, but I'd be happy to take some questions. I can hear you. I'm having a little trouble hearing you, but if you speak up, I can probably do it. Okay, so uh, we can take some questions and obviously speak loudly into the. Oh, there we go. Is that better? Oh, there, there okay, better. so um, we have a question here on the front row. Did you read Catherine Graham's book about the Washington Post? I have. I'm embarrassed to say I have not read Catherine Graham's book about the Washington Post. I hope I shouldn't. I hope that is not a bad confession that will uh, result in my removal from the post. But I have not read. The questions here are going to be tough, Matt. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Another question. Uh, one question that I have, Matt, is you, with the team of people that you have there. You know, when I was going through and paying attention to your bylines and kind of how things would line up. Sometimes you were first, sometimes you were second, sometimes you were third, and then sometimes at the bottom it would say, you know, con other contrib contributors. So how, how, how do you manage? How, how does a big story like this just get managed? Because from the outside it could look a little chaotic, but I'm sure there's a method to it. Yeah, well, I think it's both. It is a little chaotic internally because it's so big, but there is some method. In terms of the bylines, like, um, look, we we divide up who has to write every day, particularly in weeks like this last one. You know, we generally had a reporter in the building and a reporter in the office, um, in the Justice Department and in the downtown newsroom to kind of manage what was happening at the Justice Department, but also manage bosses' expectations. There's like a lot of editors with a lot of different ideas and you need a reporter here to kind of handle the writing of it and, you know, allaying bosses' fears about the process. In terms of the byline order, it just kind of varies. I mean, sometimes when you write it, but it's based on largely reporting of others, you might put your name at the back. If you had the main the main news nugget and wrote it, you might put your name at the front. If you had the main news nugget, you're probably going to be at the front. In terms of how the team is structured, um, we have on, on Justice, we have me and Devlin Barrett. On the White House, we have um, Josh, the primary people are Josh Dawsey, Phil Rucker, and Ashley Parker. On political enterprise, we primarily have Roz Helderman and Tom Hamburger. And then on Congress, we have Karin Demergian. Now we have Rachel Bade um, and Sungmin Kim. Um, I would say, oh, and then Carol Lennig also on um, political enterprise. That's kind of the core team. Each of those teams have their own editors, so they pitch ideas or get assignments from their editor. We meet as a group three times a week. How those meetings usually go is like we come in and share tips. And that's just like raw intelligence sharing. So I might come in and say, hey, I heard that a senior White House official is under investigation. And then our White House reporter would say, well, I heard this person got a document request. And you kind of tr end up you know, branching off to work with that person. Reporters then leave those meetings and editors kind of decide on slugs, like what are good story tar targets. You leave those meetings and end up collaborating with various people. And, and the names move around because the tips move around, you know, your personal life workload moves around, who's available to write moves around, but we're all sort of engaged, at least in a loose way, on everything. And then we have areas that we kind of specialize in. So the more law enforcement focused stories obviously are me and Devil, and the more White House focused stories are Josh, Phil, and Ashley. Some of the stories about people in the investigation, like George Papadopoulos, for example, Roz Helderman has kind of become the specialist in that. Your source base can dictate 
um, who you end up specializing in. Uh, so that's generally how it works. It is a little chaotic. That's why it moves around. It's not like we just have two Russia reporters. So it's one of each of their names on. We have like a dozen and then you get contributions from other portions of the newsroom. So that's why you see so many names of people involved. Great. Questions? Matt, sorry you couldn't be here. Um, I'm one of the speakers for tomorrow, so we'll have to swap email addresses. But I'm yeah. curious, as a fellow alum, could you share with the students maybe something that you did in your career as a reporter with The Post, uh, maybe an anecdote or, or a story about uh, uh, a time you covered a, a big news event here in southeastern Ohio that you still call upon in your career today? Yeah, so there's um, there's a couple of stories that I'm really proud of. Um, one, uh, I'll tell you about the one. So there was the law director at the time. I don't believe he's the law director anymore. He lost re-election kind of in the wake of this story, though. Um, maybe maybe had come back. But the city law director uh, at the time was a landlord, and a part of what the Post, when I was there, was really interested in doing was like checking out landlords, was scrutinizing landlords because student housing, you know, where kids live is like one of the core things kids in college want to know about. Um, so one of the things that entailed would be like going to, man, I don't even remember anymore, but like the records department in the city and just looking through inspection files on Houses. I always thought it would be a great idea if somebody could digitize those so students renting could could, you know, just search instead of actually having to show up at this office. But we showed up at this house. They're so voluminous that, like, it's hard to look through every one. But I had this idea. Well, the city law director is a landlord. I wonder how his properties shake out. And in fact, in looking through these files, the city law director, as I understood it then, I, I guess I believe this is still the case. He supervised the prosecutor there. So he had and hidden the files for his properties, letters like from himself threatening him if he didn't get his properties up to code. And it's just like, really? This is not a conflict? You're the person who's going to crack down on yourself? I remember like, this is such a great story. So wrote it up. Uh, it became sort of a political scandal. He did lose re-election again. Not that I was rooting for that uh, outcome. Um, it's just like an interesting topic, but that speaks to some lessons of big stories. Like I just had this idea, I'm going to look at these records. And then in just showing up at an office, going through records for this particular guy, I think, wow, this is an, an important story. And it was like a front page of the Post story. I mean, Post there, I had a lot of those, but that that story stands out now, even in my even in my career here. Um, if we do a show of hands in the room, can you see the show of hands, Matt? If, if somebody raises, I can see everybody. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question of the students. How many of you are worried about the future of journalism as as students? Worried about a job? So, Matt, what do you say to them? You're you're working in a thriving newsroom. You know, biggest story, but there's a lot of fear. Yeah, I would say a couple things. Um, I always feel guilty answering this question because the post is in such a different place than almost every newsroom across the country, particularly newsrooms in, at small to mid-sized papers. Like we have a wealthy benefactor who, and I say this um, completely lovingly, does not care what we do. And that's the best way it can go. He just writes a check, uh, we do the work, and it's great. And since Bezos bought the post, we've been freer with expenses, we've hired like crazy. I can remember a time when I first got here when I was in the Southern Maryland Bureau and the Prince George's County Bureau, and it was rough. And I mean, that's what I would say um, to students now. like. There was a time when I was here, we had made our, our sort of branding for and about Washington because we just decided we can't afford to compete on national stories. We don't have 
bureaus and places, nor can we afford them. And we would ignore a lot of national stories. I mean, I can remember big national, nationally covered shootings that we would just take wire on. Um, now we have like a network of freelancers that we use all around the country. We send many people, just like in that instance I described about Orlando, like they didn't hesitate for a second, get on a plane. And I joined a whole team of people that had flown from DC. So I would say that you can come through the dark times. We did. I am worried that the model of the richest man in the world buying the paper and not caring is not an especially sustainable one or one that's going to work for papers everywhere. Um, but look, I do think that people have a desire to know information more than they ever have. I mean, you can see it on the traffic we get for stories. Like one of these Mueller stories gets as many eyeballs as like there are papers distributed all week for the Washington Post. You can see the demand for information is there. Now, it seems to me, and I'm not expert in this, that the ad dollars haven't caught up to that. You need so much more scale online than you did for like printed paper to make the advertising money to make it worth it. But people care, people really care about news. And that's the thing that heartens me. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. And someday somebody's going to figure out how to monetize this. I'd say too, that like we now are profitable, like setting Bezos aside because of all of our hiring. I haven't seen our books, but this is what they tell us. We're in the black, you know, we're not losing money every quarter like we were by the millions of dollars when I was here initially. And that says to me, the cutting strategy, the sort of shed bodies and get expenses low so your revenues are higher is not a good one. But the model of investing, as Jeff Bezos does, and of being more ambitious does work. If you do good, ambitious work, you can be profitable. I mean, we have spent more and we have made more. Now, we're doing it at a huge scale that, again, I don't worry about the sustainability of. But at least on that scale, that's working. And I think that's because people really have this insatiable desire for information that I don't think will, will ever go away. Um, I was wondering, when there are topics that are underreported, unreported, do you think it's a benefit to have top reporters competing over the same story? And um, is there anywhere you've seen that you think deserves more coverage that people should kind of start redirecting to? And that's a really good question. I do sometimes worry about that. I mean, like, when we have some coverage of big court hearings where we can't, like, bring phones or whatever into the courtroom. We have a million bodies, you know, like we have three people in the courtroom so people can run out sort of as each verdict is read and then somebody standing outside. And it's like, geez, this is a lot of talented journalists who their time might be better spent making calls on other big stories. And it is true that like they're just become to be these dominant stories that you want to be competitive on. And one of the ways to be competitive is to put more bodies on it. But that comes at a cost. I do think at the Post, we've been fortunate and that our hiring has been really good lately. So, you know, I haven't looked around and said, gosh, we really ought to be covering that or we really ought to be covering that because we just have so many people. We always find a way at on a day to day basis. I have sometimes thought, geez, I wish we had a body to assign to this, like just for, just because it hit, you know, people are on vacation or whatever it happened to be. We couldn't do that. There was, you know, the one that's standing out in my mind, which I probably should think of a bigger thematic thing, but there was recently this woman um, who defected and who was in the military, defected and was a spy for Iran. We ran a big front page story on her one day. It happened that my colleague on the Justice Beat was off, so it was just me, but ran a big, big story on her. But then the next day it was like, well, you're back to Mueller. Um, now we assigned some general assignment reporters to look into it, but they, of course, just don't have the relationships and the expertise that you have covering the Justice Department. So it just kind of dropped. And the New York Times wrote a big story about her. I thought, oh, gosh, we sh we, I wish we had done that. And it was, 
probably going to be episodes like that where it's like, I wish we had this cover more coverage of this other Justice Department thing. This is a good example. Actually, I talked myself into a good example. Uh, when Jeff Sessions was the attorney general, he transformed the department in very dramatic ways. I mean, the Justice Department's position in civil cases shifted dramatically. I think you saw it even more dramatically today with their with their further shift of their position in the Affordable Care Act, their position on um, civil rights cases, particularly like police consent decrees and police wrongdoing cases, he really shifted the position on that. And while we covered those, they didn't get the attention that Mueller did. And like everything Sessions did was in the context of Mueller. We wrote like a big Jeff Sessions kind of profile when he was removed from the department about all the ways he had shifted the Justice Department, but it was kind of inside the paper. And then the main story, of course, is Jeff Sessions' recusal, Russia, Trump attacks. And I do worry that like the focus on Russia in some ways distracts people from some of the substantive business of the Justice Department things that are still happening. In that instance, we did cover them both, right? So you could go on the Post website and you could see a session story about how he changed um, about how he changed the department and a story about Mueller and Sessions and Trump. And the Mueller, Sessions and Trump story got many, many, many more readers. I don't know what you can do about that. People are going to read what they want to read. But it's true when you have big stories, it sucks the oxygen out of other uh, important stories, even if they're not as attention grabbing. Um, my, my question has to do with um, a recent story you did with your colleagues following um, the release of um, um, Prosecutor Mueller's um, investigation, and it's about the, the the disputes that is surrounding this particular release. Um, you know for sure that um, some facets are saying that, um, of course, there was a sort of collaboration be between um, the, the Trump campaign team and uh, that of the Russian um, the Russian government, but to some extent, um, Prosecutor Mueller could not find. Um, President Trump um, guilty on the grounds of um, obstructing justice. Um, so, as you guys wrote in that particular story, I'm wondering what sort of um, interpretation could this mean for the role of media in a democracy? Because um, by what we are seeing now, if we, from the standpoint of um, Prosecutor Mueller, we could not have a definitive yes or no regarding the investigation, and the media have to definitely interpret this sort of finding from a different lens. So what do you think about the impact such an investigation will have when you think of the role media can play in a democracy like the US? So um, my thought is like, it's certainly not our job, like the media's job, to come up with prosecutorial conclusions on both of those, on the um, obstruction piece of Mueller's case and the coordination piece, he's essentially coming up with prosecutorial decisions. On coordination, he kind of came up with, I'm not going to prosecute. On obstruction, he came up with um, he came up with a shrug, I guess is the best way I'd put it. And then Bill Barr stepped in and said, I have determined uh, there's insufficient evidence to warrant an obstruction case against the president. But I think our job as reporters is to just get to the bottom of that. Like, Right now, we only have Bill Barr's, who's the attorney general, his description of Mueller's findings. So our immediate job is to, we need more of what Mueller himself actually wrote and found. And then we need a kind of reconstruct of how we got to this point. What exactly did Mueller find? What steps did he take or choose not to take? And why did he take them? Like our job, to my mind, is just giving people information and they decide what to do with it. I'm not a prosecutor, nor do I want to be. I, you know, I don't have to come up with a, a prosecutorial conclusion of President Trump broke the law or he didn't. That uh, presumably was Mueller's job. He also punted on it and turned into Barr's job. My job is to just tell people. There's a political question here too, right? So there's a legal question of could you substantiate this case, but there's a political question of all this stuff we've learned, what should American voters do with that? What should Congress do with that? And so I feel like the media's role in this democracy is to give them more information so they can have a more informed decision. They don't have to just rely on the sort of top line conclusions and no more details. We get them more details and they kind of decide what to do. That's, that's really where I think our role is. Oh, Matt, the uh, 
several times you referred to the competitive nature of the journalism that uh, we call mainstream. And uh, Donald Trump seems to feel the opposite. He feels like there's this collective uh, effort on the part of the enemy of the, the state to uh, undermine him. And in the last 48 hours, uh, he's achieved probably the biggest victory of his presidency. Have you and your colleagues at the Post felt any direct blowback from what Barr said in his memo? And do you have any fear that uh, the public at large, or, or more particularly the extremists on the right, will further threaten the security of people like yourself through, uh, you know, we had the president talking about biker gangs. Uh, is this something that, what has been the collective reaction to the memo? I mean, was, there, was it surprise? Was it uh, shock? Or, I mean, if you're gonna tell me, well, we just took it as it was, I find that a little hard to believe, and, and particularly in the light of the um, vindictiveness that the president has unleashed in the last couple of days. So um, to your question of my personal reaction, um, I was surprised on the punt on obstruction. Um, I just thought and think that it was one of the core things that Mueller was appointed to decide, and for him not to decide surprised me, uh, and surprised me in a way that I just want to know more, and, and I have made it a reporting task to figure out why he did that. On coordination, I guess I was less surprised, um, just based on the fact that the grand jury hadn't met in many weeks, that it felt like it was trending towards a softer landing, but I didn't really know. I mean, when you go into something not having a strong sense of how it's going to go, it's hard to be surprised, if that makes sense. Um, if you've made up your mind one way and then it goes the other way, you're going to be surprised. But if you're like, well, it could be one way, it could be the other, um, it's harder. It was. I wasn't that surprised. Um, to your first question, has there been blowback for us? Certainly media reporters have, have written about what they see as some of the flaws in the Russia coverage. Like I said, sort of in the, in the talk, um, I think our coverage, uh, at least me and my immediate colleagues, was, was very fair and appropriately aggressive. This was an important investigation, probably the most important investigation of our time. You have to cover that and you have to cover that extensively. I think it is fair for there to be some reckoning of stories that got it wrong or stories that were over torqued and that is happening right now and that's fine. Um, I haven't gotten any threats from people in the wake of that. Um, I have gotten some emails from conservatives who, who think that I'm disappointed in some way that it ended the way it did and I'm not. Um, in the past, uh, my colleagues have gotten threats. Um, related to, related to, um, they've gotten threats from people who seem to be very conservative and unhappy with the coverage of the president. Um, that's troubling. You know, the we aren't the enemy of the people. Like we are people ourselves. Um, there was this great story in Columbia Journalism Review about um, the justice press room, sort of during the Mueller thing, and about during the Mueller stakeout and. Um, about how reporters were shifting plans and canceling vacations and leaving their dry cleaning at the dry cleaner for weeks. And, um, you know, I know one woman in there, her um, boyfriend's parents were in town to meet her for the first time and she just couldn't go meet them. Um, we're human beings. And like we, uh, we are interested in giving information to the public. We're not out to gore anybody, at least I'm not. Um, so, it, you know, you hate to see people react that way, like like they are my enemy. I mean, I hope that they are subscribers. Uh, I don't have an opinion on them one way or the other. Um, uh, you know, 
I worry about that. And I, and I also worry about just the polarization of people's views such that like, it doesn't matter what we write. It doesn't matter how well factually supported it is, how well sourced it is. They'll just be like, I don't believe you. Um, so I, I do worry about that. And I worry about that in this administration, but, but, you know, I worry about that constantly in any administration. So, uh, Matt, what's, what's going to happen over the next few days with the follow-up on this particular story? I mean, you're going to hopefully be in Hawaii for part of that, but there's still things unfolding. <laughs> uh, at some point, the report may actually become available, or parts of it. So does it feel like it's done to you? It, it certainly can feel that way, but I wonder if that's how it feels to you. It certainly doesn't feel like it's done, but it does feel like we've passed a big moment. Um, assuming that Barr has fairly and completely characterized Mueller's memo, we now know the very broad strokes of what the end looks like. And we know that it's over. Uh, that's an important thing in its own right. Uh, you know, so there, this certainly feels like a done moment, but it doesn't feel like the whole thing is done, if that makes sense. In the coming days, I'd expect that we, um, I don't expect that we would get the report itself in the coming days. There's just a lot of considerations. They have to, re they're going right through it right now and redacting it for grand jury material. They'll have to redact it for material that could affect these cases that Mueller has farmed out. You know, you still have the ongoing um, criminal prosecution of Roger Stone. Are there elements in the report? And this, I think, would particularly be on the coordination side, but maybe on the obstruction side, too, that you just don't want to reveal because Roger Stone hasn't gone to trial yet. Um, I think there's a lot of considerations like that, and I just don't see that happening in the next couple of days. Certainly, we're trying to get this thing or just even trying to get a better understanding of it, how many pages it is. And I do think what you'll see in the next at least a couple weeks, is Congress really pressing to get this thing, maybe even issuing a subpoena. Um, Dems yesterday said they want this thing by April 2nd. Uh, I don't think they've gone the subpoena route yet, but certainly I expect they soon will. So there'll be a great political and legal fight that we'll cover. It might not be tomorrow, but it certainly will be in the coming weeks at least. This, our coverage is not over. It's not like um, we got the top line findings and then I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a couple months off. You know, like we were still very hard at work. I mean, the reason I'm not there today, even though we learned the findings on Sunday, is because there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but this, this was an important moment. I mean, this was the end of something. Um, now there's just more work to do to figure out exactly how we got there. Another question? Anyone? Right there. So since you're like a primarily political journalist, do you take steps or does the Post take steps to keep personal politics out of pieces? And do you find it hard to keep personal politics out of pieces? Yeah, so uh, I guess first off, I consider myself primarily a law enforcement journalist, but <laughs> covering law enforcement pretty much since I got on the beat has become been come covering like law enforcement's investigation of the highest profile politician. So it's certainly fair to call me a political journalist. Uh, the post, I don't know that we have formal steps to keep personal politics out of, um, out of our stories, except that like our job is to be objective, objective. That's like what informs all of our work. You know, I try personally to keep my own views on things, uh, my own like uninformed political views out of things. I don't vote. Um, that is not something that everybody here does. And some people really don't like that. I don't do that. Some of my colleagues do be just because I feel like, well, I don't know. I don't want to go down the road of, of making up my mind in the way a voter I feel like has to. Um, uh, but I am married to uh, my wife is very liberal. Someone could, I guess, question me on that. Um, my own politics, I feel like, are pretty, pretty down the road, pretty, pretty down the middle of the road. Um, but it's not uh, to answer your question. It's not like we have formal. I don't have like a questionnaire that I fill out that says, here is how I feel on these political questions. We just try to keep that out of the coverage. That's kind of core to being a journalist. You can separate 
your own opinion from something on reporting accurately information. And I don't really worry about it. I think that was the second part of your question. Um, I, I don't I don't see, at least among my reporting colleagues, I don't see any bias creeping into the coverage. There's this insatiable desire to know more. And I think sometimes that gets interpreted as like, well, you're biased against the president. Um, but like the aggression and the desire to know more would be the case no matter who the president is. We just want information. And it is a little bit adversarial. We want to know information. Decision makers often don't want to give it to us. But that doesn't mean my politics are are different than the president's or that I'm motivated because of my political differences. This is uh, maybe loosely related to that, but not so much about the, the political side, but on social media, uh, I notice you tweet some and sometimes other reporters will tweet at you. I noticed that recently. And, I, and I'm wondering, how do you comport yourself? I mean, what is your own strategy on social media? When to tweet? when to respond to somebody, when to not respond to somebody. I, I think that's a good lesson maybe to share with, with young reporters. That's a tough one. And we do have formal guidelines on tweeting and social media posts. Um, and maybe I should have answered it that way. Um, <laughs> our guidelines might cover um, you know, injecting your personal politics on your social media pages. Um, but it's more of an art than a science. And, you know, there are probably tweets of mine that you could point out to me uh, today. And I would be like, oh, I don't know if I should have done that. Um, not because they would be political, but because they would be very snarky. Um, my, uh, my philosophy is, uh, look, I am a reporter covering a big story. And I might have insights that people would find useful that I would be willing to put in a story, but didn't. So a lot of times when there's like a big breaking news event after, and that's really important, after you have like filed all the news to your organization, whether that's internally in your content management system, whatever your responsibilities are there comes first. So that's one of my guiding principles. But then I'm willing to tweet things that couldn't get into that for whatever reason, space or, um, you know, we just decided to characterize it a different way. But my other guiding principle is like, and again, I'm sure you would point tweets and say, well, this wouldn't make it in the paper, is to not tweet anything about a subject I cover that I wouldn't sort of be willing to say on TV or to put in the newspaper. And sometimes you can add a little more voice to your tweets. I feel like that that can help. Um, and it helps it gets picked up. It helps people understand it. And it helps people understand that you're a human being. Um, but you do want to be careful not to, um, not to go too far. It also depends on the type of reporter you are. Um, we have reporters here who have, who kind of blend opinion and news. That's not exactly what I am, but if you are that, it's probably safer for you to tweet just your straight up views on a thing. Um, and there are topics that I will tweet my views on, particularly sports topics. I feel like I never have to cover that. Um, if I do, I'll recuse myself. Um, but I'm sorry, I love the calves, and I just can't hold it back on Twitter. So there are some topics that I feel like are not work-related, but that I'm also not afraid to just, just go there. Right. I, I think uh, social media is one of the areas that uh, our students uh, probably have a lot of questions about when they, when they get out. So having a personality uh, and being a person, you know, social media is an outlet for that. Uh, it's also a place where you can stub your toe pretty, pretty quickly. So, I, and no, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't found too many of your tweets. You know that I that I question. I just, I just, I know. I noticed uh, one of your. I think it was a competitor, and maybe it was the the person who's who went to the Times. So uh, that might have been a kind of, kind of an interesting back channel conversation on Twitter. But what is it like competing with people that that were your colleagues, and you know what they they know, they know what you know, and but how do you still try to beat them? Yeah, that is, uh, well, so one, my philosophy is internally, like people in the building, we're on a team, you know, and like, you got to know when it's your time to shoot and when it's your time to pass. And like, it's for the good of the team. If the post does well, that's going to reflect 
better on me. But you do have colleagues who move around. I mean, um, Devlin Barrett, who's one of my closest friends and uh, is at The Post now, he tried to recruit me to come to The Wall Street Journal when he was there. Adam Goldman, another one of my closest friends, we were on the beat together. Now he goes to The Times. We know some of each other's sources because we worked together for nearly a year. That's That can be tough, you know? And sometimes it's just in a, a sort of concession like, man, I know he knows X person and he might beat me on this one. And other times it's like, gosh, I know he knows X person. Now I need to get to know X person. Um, it, but it's just the nature of the business. And we're all, you know, the competition, we are competing. You know, it's not like all the media is colluding on, on anything. I hate it when he gets things before I do. Um, but... I also, he's also my friend, he's a human being, and we as a country and as uh, as a media organization are better when our competitors are good. It drives us all to, to be better. Just the overall quality of the work is better. So I try to keep that in mind. But it really irritates me when, when he beats me on, uh, on things. I would say, I to go back to the social media question, it is like a super high risk but potentially high reward. I mean, I see reporters who have a lot of personality on Twitter and they do quite well, but I've also seen us not hire people because of tweets they had, politically biased tweets that they've had, or not hire people because of just like unprofessional tweets they've had. Like editors, editors almost even more than reporters are plugged into Twitter, even if they don't tweet. So you gotta keep that in mind. Like you can get in trouble for your tweets. And if you're early in your career, especially, I mean, my idea would be play it lower risk, lower reward. You know, the higher rewards come when you're kind of established and nobody is going to do anything to you for expressing your opinion. You're better off to tweet less um, early in your career is my view. Well, I, I want to close this out with one um, comment that I heard from Tracy Grant, who is your managing editor who said, uh, Matt's the most competitive re reporter I know. And uh, so <laughs> I think that's a, that says a lot. And it's a good, more, a good lesson uh, for the students in the room to be competitive, you know, to want to win the, the big stories, not just to win, but to get the big story. So thank you very much, Matt. And uh, carry on with all your great work. Yeah, thank you. Right? Yeah.